everybody. This is R&B and gospel singer Shirley Murla. And I am Dale Anthony Rose from the Blue Star. And we just stopped by to wish the Arkansas Mark the King Junior Commission happy 28th anniversary. 28 years. 28 years. Keep smiling. Keep smiling. Knowing you can always count on me. For sure. That's what friends are for. I'm MC Light, your tour guide through the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission's virtual voyage through African American history. I'd like to wish the Arkansas MLK Commission a happy 28th anniversary. We thank you for all you do in the community and across the state. I want to send a special shout out to Deshaun Scarborough for keeping Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream alive. Formed in 1993, the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission, a division of the Arkansas Department of Education, serves Arkansans of all ages and cultural backgrounds throughout the four congressional districts of Arkansas. In its effort to encourage Arkansans to reflect on the life and teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. through educational endeavors, cultural performances, exhibitions, and public community outreach projects that are multi-ethnic and family-oriented. It is one of many duties of the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission to promote among the people of Arkansas by appropriate activities, both awareness and appreciation of the civil rights movement, as well as enable the people of Arkansas to reflect on the life and teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. through the donations and contributions from individuals as well as public and private organizations in order to carry out these statutory responsibilities. Amid these unprecedented times and difficulties, the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission is mindful of the reason it exists. It is because the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission prepares Arkansans to create a more just, humane, and peaceful world using Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s six principles of nonviolence and the six steps of nonviolent social change. It is because, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. so often stated, the aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community. The aftermath of nonviolence is redemption and reconciliation. Please welcome award-winning journalist Rochelle Turner with a special message for the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission. Happy 28th anniversary to the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission. My name is Rochelle Turner. I'm a reporter in Houston, Texas, but for two years, I worked closely with the MLK Commission and traveled to Selma, Alabama for the Jubilee Crossing. I was awarded for my excellence in broadcast journalism and connecting Arkansans to history. My favorite quote from Dr. King is the time to do right is always right. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of the MLK Commission and happy anniversary. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitably, but comes through continuous struggle. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Through the programming of the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission, it has always been their goal to bridge generational gaps. 
Dr. King's work and the efforts of many who fought for civil rights locally are just as important today as they were then. Join me today as we pause to take a virtual trip through black history, paying tribute to several trailblazers, moments in history, and Arkansas greats featured in the Arkansas African American History Makers Coloring Book published by the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission. Today, the work of the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission and its duty aligned partners is critically important to turning the tide and transforming the world. During his years of social leadership, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. encouraged all people to address pressing social ills by way of citizen service. As he once said, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. The commission hosts the largest day of service in the nation and is lauded nationally as the most active commissions in the nation honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And now, introducing the Argenta Music Group, a Black-owned production company that produces music, featuring their new artist, Valerisa Bell. She will perform her new rendition of Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, produced by Arkansas super producer and CEO of Argenta Music Group, Mr. Carl Dupins. purpose of me putting this emphasis in this news conference today on this legislation is that I want to make the case to the people of Arkansas that this is important for us as a state. And we've talked about it some, but we really haven't focused on the reason that it is important. I believe that this is important to us, not just as a statement, but is important as a mark in history that we recognize in its fullest degree the contributions of Dr. Martin Luther King. It is a national holiday that is celebrated in a national context, but in Arkansas, uh, whenever that holiday was adopted, we in essence gave the people of Arkansas a choice. And we said that you can celebrate the contribution of Dr. Martin Luther King, or you can remember on the same day, uh, General Robert E. Lee. On March 20th, 2017, Governor Asa Hutchinson signed a bill granting Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. his own day of observance, separate from Confederate General Robert E. Lee, leaving only two states remaining that honor the two men on the same day. Both Lee and King were born in January. Governor Hutchinson championed the bill, which also included educational components about the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s footsteps of service led him to Arkansas, where he made several stops. In 1958, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. attended the graduation ceremonies for Little Rock Central High School's first African-American graduate, Ernest Green. That same year, he also delivered the commencement speech at the University of Arkansas Pine Bluffs graduation ceremonies. In 1963, he delivered the anniversary sermon at Little Rock's First Baptist Church on 7th and Gain Street and stayed in church's parsonage. The Bible Dr. King used is currently at the church on display in the foyer. First Missionary Baptist Church is one of the oldest African-American churches in Arkansas. 
the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission provided renovations to the historic parsonage where Dr. King stayed during his visit. Al Bell is an American music icon, record producer, songwriter, and record executive, co-owner of world-famous Stax Records, based in Memphis, Tennessee. A former disc jockey in his hometown of Little Rock, Arkansas, Mr. Bell helped launch the careers of Stax soul legends, such as the Staple Singers, Isaac Hayes, The Emotions, The Dramatics. Under his leadership, Stax became one of the largest African-American owned businesses in the 1970s. Following his career at Stax, Bell became president of Motown Records Group. Arkansas has its share of African Americans who have made great contributions to the entertainment industry, including Sister Rosetta Tharp, Rudy Ray Moore, Cheryl Underwood, Al Green, William Grant Still, Lenny Williams, John H. Johnson. Of the United States. And the Constitution. And the Constitution. Of the state of Arkansas. Of the state of Arkansas. And that I would faithfully discharge. And that I would faithfully discharge. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. Of mayor. Of mayor. Of the city of Little Rock. Of the city of Little Rock. Arkansas. Arkansas. Upon which I Little am Rock voters made history on I'm December 4th, 2018, <laughs> when they selected the city's first black mayor by popular vote, Frank Scott Jr., as the city's 73rd mayor. Richard May Sr. received his BA degree from Howard University in Washington, DC, and graduated from the University of Arkansas School of Law. After law school, Mr. May served as the Pulaski County Deputy Prosecuting Attorney. In 1972, he was elected to the Arkansas General Assembly, becoming among the first African Americans elected to serve as state representative since the 1893 post-segregation era. Mr. Mays is a former Arkansas Supreme Court Justice appointed by President Clinton during his first term as governor of Arkansas. And in 1990, Mr. Mays was appointed to the Arkansas Ethics Commission by then Governor Clinton and served as its first chairman. He now leads a successful law firm at Mays, Bird and Associates. In 1954, the Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka was a landmark decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in which the court ruled that American state laws establishing racial segregation in public schools are unconstitutional, even if the segregated schools are otherwise equal in quality. Turn the page a little closer to home, there were four school districts in Arkansas that made significant strides in civil rights history. The Charleston Public School District in Franklin County quietly and successfully integrated first through 12th grades and opened for the fall term in 1954. Charleston was the first school district in the former Confederate States to integrate all 12 grades. And as a result, Charleston School District has been named a national commemorative site by the U.S. Department of the Interior National Park Service. The Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission salutes the brave citizens of Hoxie, Arkansas, who integrated Hoxie Public Schools in 1955, two years before Little Rock Central High School, known as the Hoxie Integration. The office of the superintendent played a pivotal part in the decision to integrate Hoxie schools. Hoxie superintendent, Kunkel Edward Vance, who believed in educational opportunity for all children and spearheaded plans to integrate the schools, received the unanimous support of Hoxie School Board. On July 11, 1955, Hoxie schools recommenced and allowed African-American students to attend. In order to do what was morally right in the sight of God and to uphold the law of the land, Vance insisted that all facilities, including restrooms and cafeterias, be integrated. The North Little Rock Six were six African-American students who attempted to desegregate North Little Rock High School on September 9, 1957. 
Seven seniors from the all-black Scipio Jones High School initially registered to attend North Little Rock High for 1957 and 58 school year, but only six students attempted to enroll. They were Richard Lindsay, Gerald Persons, Harold Smith, Eugene Hall, Frank Henderson, and William Henderson. When the students arrived at school, they were met with a mob and opposition. According to the Associated Press, the district school superintendent advised the six students to enroll in Scipio Jones High School, an all-black school due to the temperament of the crowd. The six students did not attempt again to desegregate the school. The North Little Rock School District did not desegregate until September 3rd, 1964. The Little Rock Nine were the nine African-American students who desegregated Little Rock Central High School in 1957. Their entrance into the school sparked a nationwide crisis when Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus, in a defiance of a federal court order, called out the Arkansas National Guard to prevent the Nine from entering. President Dwight D. Eisenhower ordered the National Guard and units of the U.S. Army's 101st Airborne Division to escort the Nine into the school on September 25, 1957. The Little Rock Nine were Carlotta Walls, Jefferson Thomas, Gloria Ray, Ernest Green, Elizabeth Eckford, Thelma Mothershed, Terrence Roberts, Minnie Jean Brown, and Melba Patillo. The NAACP was a driving force for change during the civil rights movement. NAACP President Daisy Bates was catapulted into the national spotlight when the Little Rock Nine attended the all-white Central High School. Miss Bates guided and advised the Nine students. Her home served as a haven and meeting place for the Little Rock Nine and several notable civil rights figures, including Thurgood Marshall and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The Bates home is now a National Historic Landmark. Her prominence as one of the few female civil rights leaders of the period was recognized by her selection as the only female to speak at the Lincoln Memorial at the March on Washington on August 28, 1963. Soon, Miss Daisy Bates will be immortalized in our nation's capital representing Arkansas in National Statuary Hall. Her presence will make a powerful statement to the millions who visit the Capitol each year. With the selection of Daisy Bates, Arkansas is one of the first states to choose an African American to represent it in Statuary Hall. The Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission is proud to serve on the National Statuary Hall Steering Committee. As the Arkansas Field Secretary for NAACP, Attorney Christopher Columbus Mercer Jr. was an advisor to Miss Daisy Bates during the 1957 desegregation of Little Rock Central High School. He drove six of the Little Rock Nine to school each day. He was one of the six students who integrated the University of Arkansas School of Law and passed the bar exam with the highest score in his group. He was the first African-American in the South to serve as a deputy state prosecutor and practice law for more than 58 years, often representing economically disadvantaged clients. Hope Arkansas native attorney John Walker fought discrimination across several platforms. Walker founded the first racially integrated law firm in Arkansas. He graduated from what was then the all black Arkansas agriculture, mechanical and normal college now called the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff and went on to earn his law degree from Yale Law School. Attorney Walker is best known for his work in education and civil rights. Bass Reeves was born into slavery in Crawford County in July 1838. He escaped slavery and found a new home in Indian Territory, which is modern day Oklahoma, with the Creek and Seminole Indians. It is thought that he served with a Native American military unit during the Civil War.
In 1875, Reeves became a deputy U.S. Marshal, making him one of the first black federal lawmen west of the Mississippi River. He became a legend during his lifetime for his ability to catch criminals, especially under difficult circumstances. Belle Starr, a famous female outlaw of the time, turned herself in at Fort Smith when she found out Reeves had a warrant for her arrest. Bass Reeves was such an outstanding lawman that he once caught 19 horse thieves at one time and even arrested his own son for murder. Carmen Helton became the first African-American woman in North Little Rock Police Department to be promoted as sergeant. Sheriff Eric Higgins made history in 2018 as the first African-American sheriff 200 years after the Pulaski County Sheriff's Office was formed. Brigadier General William J. Johnson served in the Arkansas National Guard for more than 36 years in various leadership capacities. On January 1st, 2008, Brigadier General Johnson assumed duties as Deputy Adjutant General, Arkansas National Guard. As the Deputy Adjutant General, he served as the full-time Chief Advisor and Principal Assistant to the Adjutant General and provided leadership to over 10,000 Army soldiers and airmen. Brigadier General Johnson is the first African-American general in the history of the Arkansas National Guard, and he was inducted into the Arkansas Black Hall of Fame and the Arkansas National Guard OCS Hall of Fame. A rock, a river, a tree, hosts to species long since departed, marked the mastodon the dinosaur who left dry tokens of their sojourn here on our planet floor. Born on April 4th, 1928 in St. Louis, Missouri, writer and civil rights activist Maya Angelou is known for her 1969 memoir, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, which made literary history as the first nonfiction bestseller by an African-American woman. Miss Angelou spent most of her childhood years in Stamps, Arkansas. In 1971, Angelou published her Pulitzer Prize nominated poetry collection, Just Give Me a Cool Drink of Water For I Die. She later wrote the poem On the Pulse of Morning, one of her most famous works, which she recited at President Bill Clinton's inauguration in 1993. <laughs> Our journey has been documented in detail. We have listened to the words of our aquatic ancestors through seashells. I feel like I didn't even complain to God once or twice through email. And he replied back all the time that we shall overcome. Even during the pandemic, I can't tell my people to come over. It seems like for some reason, things don't change with the seasons, but there's a lot of seasoning in what we've changed, what we've rearranged, even though sometimes the fruit is still strange. We hang with our people that we call our gang, Taylor gang. We slang words in ebony phonics, hot toddies in different tonics to knock that cold right out you. But now it's hot in here and I hear the heat from the mouth of the dragon bragging about how I'm trapped in the belly sweet as a telly is my true struggle as I 
juggle and don't fumble. I just ball. I call on all of those who have passed before me and that have hung off the mask before me as performing this poem. I even think that somehow in my blood we know them. because we came from being ownership to having ownership. Let's believe I'm on my chips. I, I have so much to say to those that rip. I mean, rest in peace. Or should it mean return if possible? Or have they already come back through me? Through the progeny. Our ancestry is born and reborn and born again. Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holla at me. So now that we yet make another migration mentally from the bottom to the top. I thought I told you that we won't stop. Charlotte Andrew Stevens was the first African-American teacher in the Little Rock Pulaski County School District. She worked as a teacher for 70 years and Stevens Elementary School in Little Rock was named for her in 1910. Stevens worked as a teacher in Little Rock for 70 consecutive years before her retirement in 1939. As an educator, Miss Eddie Mae Heron changed a lot of lives. Miss Heron was the only teacher at the one room school for the African American children who attended between the years of 1948 to 1965. She began her teaching career in what was known as the Biggers Colored School of Biggers, Arkansas in 1940, but moved with the children to Pocahontas with the closure of the Biggers School. In this one room school, Miss Eddie May taught everything with heavy emphasis on the basics, especially reading. Miss Annie Abrams is a retired teacher, civic activist, mentor, and cultural worker. Miss Abrams, affectionately known as Mother Abrams, has many life experiences and more than 50 years of community service, including receiving the making of the King Holiday Award from the Martin Luther King Jr. Federal Holiday Commission by Miss Coretta Scott King and being selected as the North American delegate to the United Nations Conference in Switzerland. After the first national observance of the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, Miss Abrams founded the annual King Holiday Marade in Little Rock with a few community members in her living room. She has been inducted into the Arkansas Black Hall of Fame and has received several awards for community service and commitment to education. Her home is a library and features a wide variety of local and national history, photos, books, and political memorabilia. Shorter College is a two-year institution of higher learning with a liberal arts curriculum that has expanded to include paraprofessional programs. Founded as Bethel Institute in 1886 by the African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME, to educate former slaves and to train teachers, the college is governed by a 33-member board of trustees, chaired by the bishop of the AME's 12th Episcopal District in Arkansas and Oklahoma. I shared with you from the book, The Lion, and the lion also referred to, that's where the bus ended at 12 o'clock. <laughs> and if you didn't catch that 12 o'clock bus, you were subject to be arrested on 9th Street. Uh, for 9th Street, as I said, that's where we went to eat. That's where we went to get our hair done. That's where we went to the funeral homes that were owned by blacks. That was right off of 10th Street where the blacks were birthed. You birthed right off of 9th Street and you were funeralized 
from right off 9th Street. That were the film homes. But also on 9th and Broadway where the black man, Mr. Carter, had been lynched, was the development of a business compound, kind of like Dillard's, kind of like uh, Walmart. It was known as the Mosaic Templars, which was a convention center. It was a place where doctors and black doctors and lawyers had their businesses. And there was fraternal orders. And that building is still there on Ninth and Broadway. On Ninth Street was the movie theaters, just like any other business district during the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. Well, it was in the 49, 49, 50, well, 40, I start working there 47. 47, 48, 49, and 50. I worked at the gym theater, the movie theater. And that was where I had one of my first public jobs. I also went to the churches on 9th Street or right off 9th Street, which are known as a historic district. And in this book, in my library, I have the National Register of Historic Places, African American Historic Places. And some of the street, some of the churches and some of the uh, buildings are on the historic roster uh, in this book. Okay. But Ninth Street, had, Ninth Street, had an open end and a closed end. It went all the way across town at that time. And Ninth and High and Ninth and Broadway is where the majority of the blacks who were the class called educated people and the educated people were the ones who were teachers, lawyers, doctors, morticians, and beauticians, and barbers, and seamstresses. Reverend J.C. Crenshaw, whose son went to Tuskegee and was the first to know how to fly a plane and became famous, he grew up on 9th Street in his daddy's shop where he learned to be a tailor, make men's suits. So 9th Street had some of the oldest churches, either right on 9th Street or a block or two away, like Mount Zion Baptist Church, like the Episcopalian Church that was the white Episcopalian. And of course, Bethel, A-M-E, Bethel African American Episcopal, was a part of the African church that split off from the United Methodist Church, which was the white church. And 9th Street Bethel Church people were copies of Mother Bethel, Big Bethel, in the North. West 9th Street in downtown Little Rock was a city within a city. African Americans had everything they needed on West 9th Street. Some of the black owned businesses housed on this street included delivery services, drug stores, grocery stores, newspaper publication offices, auto repair shops, and athletic centers. The business district was vibrant, bustling, and complete and an epicenter for entertainment, where you might catch a performance from Duke Ellington, Ray Charles, B.B. King, Cab Calloway, or Ike and Tina Turner. The Mosaic Templars Cultural Center stands at the entry of the historic West 9th Street District. The Mosaic Templars of America was an African-American fraternal organization offering mutual aid to the black community. The organization founded in Little Rock in 1882 and incorporated by two former slaves, John Edward Bush 
and Chester W. Keats. Taking its name from the biblical character of Moses, the organization offered illness, death, and burial insurance to African Americans at a time when white insurers refused to treat black customers equally. At its peak in the 1920s, the organization had an estimated membership of over 100,000 members and had chapters in 26 states, the Caribbean and South and Central America. My name is Tim Campbell. I'm a second year student at the Clinton School of Public Service. I um, also serve as community activist. And I'm here to talk to you guys about the deep, deep history of what happened right here on these streets of 9th Street. As you can see, when you look around, it's not so much of what this was um, nearly 60 to 70 years ago. Um, it's fairly different. There are some buildings still standing, as we can see. Um, so this building in particular, the Mosaic Temple, um, which is, was started by um, John Edward Bush, and which is, a, which is a, I, have all, I have so much great history behind these buildings that I didn't know until I was this age. So John Edward Bush actually was my father's principal at Capitol Hill Elementary School. Um, so my dad would tell me how he was raised um, on the Mar Martin Luther King Street uh, and he stayed where DHS is today, or behind DH where DHS is today. And he would walk to school, and he would tell me how this was a center and not, almost like a sea of African American unity within these streets, within this this environment. It was strictly for African Americans um, within this time. So John Edward John Edward Bush, a also a mailman, a former slave, became a mailman. Um, they had a great history of leadership, particularly on this street. Still standing here on 9th Street, we see that after uh, emancipation, slaves relocated here to Little Rock, Arkansas. They felt like this was a safe place um, to start, you know, African-American legacy. So when they got here, you know, they would build tents, they would build cabins in this area around this street in order to prepare place and businesses and, 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 and vocations and trade schools for African Americans to develop skills to thrive in America that we know today. After they resettled here, um, they would begin uh, building through what we call fraternal, fraternal systems of order. And you have the Mosaic, Mosaic, um, with Mosaic, which was one, and you also have the Daughters and Knights of Templar, which was also one. So these, these, these sort of organizations created ground in place for African Americans to build and socialize and move up the socioeconomic ladder here in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, you have notable people that are still noted throughout the community today. One is Dr. Charles Petaway. Um, as you go off near Main Street behind there, that community is called the Petaway neighborhood, named after Dr. Ch Charles Petaway, which was basically an African-American doctor who performed his he performed his practice right here on 9th Street. And his, one of his mottos was to prepare proper health insurance and health policies for all races, but particularly for African-American youth and African-American elderly. So before this was called 9th Street, it was all, uh, firstly called, originated to call West Hazel Street and nicknamed The Line, um, also because it served as a line between the African-American community and what kind of the ownership of that and also the white community. So it was also nicknamed The Line, also nicknamed Blissville because it was just like this new fresh start for Af African-American people. Between the years of, 19, of 1870 and 1893, Arkansas actually had 20 black legislators, which was a great prime time um, uh, occasion for the nation to have that many uh, African-Americans 
in the General Assembly. Um, also, uh, this, this place just wasn't political. It also had restaurants, dancing halls, and one of those restaurants, my personally, my dad would tell me, you know, because of Jim Crow, that it was a black-owned fish market, but black people still had to eat and stand out in the back, and that really it really, it just took a breath of air out of me because it was just like, wow, even with the black ownership, the Jim Crow law stood so strong that black people still had to simulate at their own, at their own foundations, at their own businesses. So after the, we, we fast forward a little bit, after, you know, the establishment and the great people that kind of cornered this particular area, we get into the latter um, 1920s. In the 1920s, it was, it, was, it was thriving, business were flourishing, but as we all know, unfortunately, 1929 and 1930, the Great Depression hit. So you see a down rise of a lot of these buildings, a lot of people, a lot of these businesses went into bankrupt. It was a total of 16 businesses. I think 11 of those businesses were bankrupt and no longer could perform um, financially. Um, so fast forward, well, kind of backtracking a little bit, to the story of John Carter, which is a very unfortunate, um, a sad, scapegoated situation uh, where a little, uh, a white girl was basically killed and her name was Felonia McDonald. And she was killed at the, and her body was found in the bell tower at the pres first Presbyterian church. And when people found that body, they suspected a janitor at the church had done this, which is um, Lonnie Dixon. And he was arrested, took into jail. People wanted to boycott the jail, you know, get out and do violence to him. So that jail actually took him in a car to Tennessee and got him out of here. And with that anger that the Little Rock community felt, they needed a scapegoat. They wanted to take that out on somebody. So here John Walker is, John Carter, I'm sorry. Here John Carter is um, minding his own business. Um, he, he approached two white ladies, and there's been a million stories about what happened. Um, so pretty much the story, the truest story I've heard is um, the horse was having issues, and the horse could no longer pull the carriage. He actually got and fixed that problem that they were having, and after that, he was accused of assassin or assaulting those two white women. And after he ran, a posse came and chased him into the woods and they beat him um, with sticks or anything that they could find. They brought him back to 9th Street and there was a church here um, called Bethel. Um, they went into that church, they got pews, they got podiums, they got chairs and they built a bonfire. And they built this bonfire and just to, 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 to erupt fear and terror for the people that were staying here, people that were surrounding this area. They hung his body on a light pole on this very street. They put his body on top of a car, hung about a light pole, drew and the car drove off, the body was hanging. There was 5,000 people here, 5,000 people here to watch what happened, men, women, and children watching the situation with John Carter. And shortly after, you see 10,000 people out here. And police at the time said that they couldn't do anything because there were armed men surrounding the posse. So with that story, um, a, a very sad, unfortunate scapegoated story with John Carter um, was very unfortunate. They basically um, hung him, hung his body. And with that bonfire, they threw his body in that bonfire. Someone tore off his arm and directed traffic with his arm signaling left and signaling right very unfortunate story um rod police later came with ride gear um a lot of those people that were a part of that policy they ran off their separate ways but no one was convicted and no one was taken to jail
So here we are standing in front of the Taborian Hall, whereby this served as a centerpiece of entertainment for black Americans, um, especially after World War II had happened and soldiers had came back into town. Um, a lot of the business had closed due to the um, Great Depression, but we still had our entertainment. We still had our dancing. We still had our fun. And this building, which was um, spearheaded by Scipio Jordan, uh, which is also a great leader and also a um, an ex-slave as well. Um, he spearheaded this building, and as you know, as you can see today, it's still standing. The only actual piece of history that we have to look at from the Ninth Street happenings. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so this building actually um, built was actually built sixty-five thousand dollars. And back in those days, that was extremely a lot of money, but it was put together through donations with people in the community, um, which, was a, which, which was great because it was built by uh, African-Americans that had skills, that learned these skills of, of, of masonry, of carpentry work, while um, passed down from generations through slavery or, or through their grandparents and fathers and mothers. And this is a result of that here in Little Rock, Arkansas.
Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission is a division of the Arkansas Department of Education. What happened on the morning of September 15, 1963 at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama shocked the nation. A local chapter of the Ku Klux Klan placed bombs at the 16th Street Baptist Church and set them off as Sunday services prepared to commence on the morning of September 15, 1963. Four little girls who were getting ready for Sunday school were killed in the explosion. The clock stopped at 10.22 a.m., the time of the explosion. Earlier that year, the church had become a staging ground for a campaign to desegregate the city led by the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and a local minister, Fred Shuttlesworth. Its purpose is national, not regional. This Civil Rights Act is a challenge to all of us to go to work in our communities and our states, in our homes and in our hearts, to eliminate the last vestiges of injustice. The following summer, the United States Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was signed by President Lyndon B. Johnson. The bombing is marked in history as a crucial moment in the civil rights movement. There was a fifth girl, Sarah Collins Rudolph, a living witness to history. She survived the blast. The Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission hosted a lecture from Ms. Collins for students. Yes, uh, you know, during the time that I was uh, going through the trauma that I was going through, you know, I was 12 years old. And I began to believe that the things of this world would help that trauma, like drinking and drugs and stuff like that. But I just found out for myself that the drugs and the alcohol, it didn't work. I had to go to God. The only thing that helped me during that time to get over that, my nervous condition was him. Well, I'm, I'm about to let him know about what happened on that Sunday morning, how uh, the bomb went off and what happened. Let them know about the service. But there was one more girl. Eddie Mae's younger sister is our keynote speaker today. Sarah Collins Rudolph, who was 12 years old at the time. She survived the bombing in 1963. She had 21 pieces of glass embedded in her face and was blinded in one eye. Hmm. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke at the memorial services for three of the girls killed in the bombing. He addressed an estimated 3,300 attendees saying, in spite of the darkness of this hour, we must not become bitter. So at this time, even though history is at sometimes is difficult to discuss, it is necessary so that we can bring about understanding, reconciliation, and we can observe points in history so that we will never forget the youngest martyrs of the civil rights movement, the four little girls. And therefore, the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission is pleased to present the fifth girl, Miss Sarah Collins Reed. Thank you so much. God bless you, you all. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, I wouldn't be here today. Amen. I thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I would like to read some of the Jim Crow laws back there doing the uh, eight. 80s to the 60s. It shall be unlawful for a Negro and white person to play together or in company with each other in any games or cards or dice 
dominoes are checked. Date, the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission has had two directors, Deshaun Scarborough and former Senator Tracy Steele. Little Rock native Sidney Moncrief played college basketball for the Arkansas Razorbacks and professional basketball for the Milwaukee Bucks. He led the Razorbacks to three Southwest Conference championships, was named as an NBA All-Star five times and Defensive Player of the Year. Hamburg, Arkansas native Scottie Pippen was named one of the 50 greatest players in NBA history and is one of four players to have his jersey retired by the Chicago Bulls. Pippen is the only NBA player to have won an NBA title and Olympic gold medal in the same year twice. Jermaine Taylor is an American former professional boxer. He remains the most recent undisputed middleweight champion having won the WBA, the WBC, IBF, WBO, Ring Magazine, and Lineal titles in 2005 by beating Bernard Hopkins, and in doing so, ending Hopkins' 12-year reign as middleweight champion. This made Taylor the first and to date only male boxer in history to claim each title from all four major boxing sanctioning organizations in a single fight. Grandmaster Richard E. Anderson is the first African American to reach his ninth degree black belt in the American Taekwondo Association and is the highest ranking African American in an estimated 400,000 members of the ATA, the World Traditional Taekwondo Union, and the Songham Taekwondo Federation combined. Having been with the ATA for more than 40 years, Grandmaster Anderson teaches discipline through Taekwondo at his martial arts school, Camp Positive in Little Rock, to mostly low income and at risk youths, where he stresses the importance of academic achievement by encouraging good grades and a yes I can mindset. The Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission, a division of the Arkansas Department of Education, encourages you to support the RISE initiative, reading initiative for student excellence. Help us to build a culture of reading. Learn about great stories told and untold of African American history makers year round read a book. Visit your local library online today. 